Hi there, Chris from Toast EV and here we're joined with Stephen Lambert. He's the head of electrification at McLaren Applied. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, there. thanks for having me. Um, Stephen, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do at McLaren Applied? Yeah, so um, I'm head of electrification at McLaren Applied, so I look after our electrification business. Um, we, we do a number of things at McLaren Applied um, from in different markets, including automotive, motorsport, public transport, but also from a technology point of view, so telemetry, controls, analytics, and of course, uh, electrification. And, and I focus on, as I say, our electrification technology, so that can be motors, inverters, batteries, DC-DC converters, really developing the next generation of electrification technology that can go out into either our motorsport customers or our more mainstream OEM automotive customers. Interesting. And uh, tell us a little bit more about in terms of the OEM side of stuff. So uh, aside from people who will know McLaren, obviously McLaren Applied is different. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that that link to, to the consumers. Yeah, so um, it's important to say, so McLaren Applied is a products company. We, we don't do consultancy, we, we sell products. And actually the majority of our business is selling products to companies that aren't related to McLaren. So we sell into all of the Formula One teams, we sell into Formula E teams, we sell into all sorts of motorsport um, series. Um, but we also have quite a large business selling into automotive. Um, because of the, the association with McLaren, we can't necessarily talk about that or publicise it, um, but we are behind some of the technology in, in a number of other another, um, OEM's vehicles. Um, and that can be from autonomous vehicle technology to uh, control technology and, of course, electrification. Brilliant. And so tell us a little bit more about the shift over the last couple of years, specifically in terms of the consumer world, as to like high performance in terms of the high performance motors, inverters, batteries, basically the whole kind of ecosystem you'd kind of think, or the electrification of vehicles. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. So we're currently in what I like to call the second wave of electrification. Um, I actually stole this from somebody else, but there was, there was a first wave of electrification um, started around you know the early 2000s where you had a sort of cottage industry of people looking at electrification and some of those people have survived many haven't the obvious ones being someone like tesla for example and um, of course the you know the largest selling ev manufacturer in the world now um and that, that was kind of the first wave sort of early 2000s to sort of middle of sort of 2010s we're now seeing this sort of second wave where all of the automotive OEMs are scrambling really to bring out their first EVs and sort of solidify a position in the market of having an EV. They're seeing all of the uh, government um, interventions coming in and saying the future has to be electric in some way. Um, and they're trying to understand the technology, understand the business case, the warranty liabilities and, and how electrification is going to pay a, a part in their, um, in their future. And that's kind of the second wave. What we expect to see then is a third wave coming in soon after when all of the all of the sort of main OEMs have got products in the market. And then it's all about differentiating that product. So it's not about just having an electric vehicle and that being enough. It's about making sure your electric vehicle is better than the one you're competing against. Um, and so at McLaren Applied, we're always looking at the future of the technology and where the market is going and how we can how we can support that. And so we we see the big the, the big difference being a focus on uh, efficiency. So we see that today with internal combustion engines, everything's got to be more efficient, more miles per gallon. Um, and if, if, you, if you're sort of, it's sort of thought of that electric vehicles are just, they're just more eco-friendly, so we don't need to worry about that. Well, in the future, that'll become what differentiates. If you have a more efficient drivetrain, you can have a smaller battery. And of course, the battery is probably the biggest cost um, within an electric vehicle. If it's more efficient, you're using less energy from the grid. And of course, that's got a positive impact on um, the amount of renewables we use on our grid and those sorts of things. Um, if you're more efficient, you're also getting rid of less heat. So you've also got uh, less cooling on the car. Um, things become smaller and lighter, and particularly in higher volumes, when things become smaller and lighter and they tend towards the raw material costs, they become cheaper again. So it's going to this what we're looking at is a third wave where efficiency is going to drive a lot of the differentiation in the market. And that's where we see ourselves providing the next generation of technology. So naturally going on that, how do you improve efficiency? <laughs> Great question. Well, there's, there's, there's kind of two ways of doing it. Um, there's, there's two aspects to it. One is moving to 800 volts. So the majority of vehicles today are 400 volts. Um, Porsche bought out the Taycan last year, um, which was the first 800 volt vehicle. Um, but what's really interesting is when you look at um, 
when you look at some of the sort of forums and some of the feedback from the owners of the TACAM, one of the criticisms that some sometimes levied at it is it's not very efficient in terms of how it uses its energy. So it's 800 volts and that gives an advantage in charge time. And, um, you know, that, that's a major barrier to entry, but it's not necessarily very efficient. That moving to 800 volts doesn't give you that efficiency. If you combine the 800 volts with a move to silicon carbide technology, um, that gives you a big advantage in terms of efficiency. So um, if, if, in case you don't know, silicon carbide is a technology used in the inverters. The inverters essentially are the uh, motor controllers. So they control the motors. They're kind of the intelligence in the motor. And they switch at a very high speed and convert DC from the battery to AC for the motors. Um, current technology is based on IGBT silicon. And that's reasonably reasonably efficient. If you move to silicon carbide, it's it's more efficient because it's it's there's less heat generated every time it switches. But it can also what's more important is it can also switch more quickly, more fast at higher switching speeds, and that allows you to then optimize the drivetrain. So you get what we consider a sort of virtuous cycle. So if you move to silicon carbide and you can switch more quickly, you get a more efficient inverter. If you switch more quickly, you can go for a higher speed motor. When you have a higher speed motor, it's then a lower torque motor and less current is needed for the same torque. That gives you a more efficient motor design, so you get some efficiency there. You also get a smaller and lighter motor. And with electric with motors, because they're essentially lumps of aluminium and, and magnets, um, they tend towards raw material costs. So your motor's smaller as well as being more efficient and it's cheaper. Um, because you've then got a more efficient drivetrain, you need less cooling, about 60% less cooling. So you have less radiators, less pumps, less, uh, less water on the car to cool it. Um, and because you're more efficient, you also need less battery. Um, so we see somewhere, when moving to 800 volts and silicon carbide, somewhere between a 5 and 10% increase in range um, for a given battery side. That depends on the size of battery and the type of technology. But you can start to see how using the right technology and optimising the whole drivetrain and perhaps not just focusing on the battery, you get a much more cohesive and much, much more um, efficient system as a whole. Brilliant. It's funny because I'm actually going to be testing the Porsche Taycan very soon. So, so it's going to be perfect timing for that. Maybe I can talk about it. Um, but um, does it matter in terms of how many motors you've got in a car? So most cars have only a singular motor, whereas more of the high performance have dual motors. And I think you've got some extreme cases where you've got quad motors, like for example, the Rimac um, vehicles out there. So how would that um, impact the inverter and the overall efficiency? Yeah, and there's, 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 there's an interesting difference. So there's, there's the efficiency that you will get um, over a WLTP or an NEDC cycle, a standardized drive cycle. Um, when you move to higher power vehicles, you actually will tend to get a higher efficiency. So the, higher, so the more motors or the higher power you have, you'll tend to have a higher efficiency because your drivetrain is designed to work at that higher power. And therefore the currents that you're using on those NEDC or WLTP cycles are actually low compared to the maximum current that your drivetrain can, can do. So you end up having a really efficient drivetrain when you have a much more higher power vehicle um, when measured like that. Um, but of course, um, you know, if you want, if you want a higher power vehicle, then it will be, it depends on how fast you want to go, of course. Um, if, you know, you, there's an argument that you're not being very efficient if you're driving very quickly. Um, but, but, but certainly in, in terms of the drive cycles, it'll look more efficient um, and actually will be, well, it will be more efficient at, at everyday driving. Interesting. Okay. And then can you talk about in terms of the lifespan of not only like the, let's say electrification, but obviously a lot of people think of the battery when it comes to degradation, but what about in terms of the motors, the inverters, the, pretty much the whole, again, the whole sort of ecosystem between electric vehicle. Um, how is that in terms of the overall lifespan of an electric vehicle, specifically when you compare it to a regular combustion engine vehicle? Well, I think one of the, one of the great things about electric vehicles is actually from a maintenance point of view, there's, there's not a lot to maintain. Um, you know, you don't have to change the oil. Um, you have to change the brake pads a lot less. Um, so, you know, the motors will last the life of the vehicle. The inverters will last the life of the vehicle. The, the electronics will, will easily last the life of the vehicle. You know, the main concern, which is pretty well known, is the battery. Um, you know, that is a big a big portion of the cost of the vehicle. Um, and if that goes wrong, um, you know, people are worried about that quite rightly. Um, however, saying that, I think what we're seeing though is battery technology now is getting to the point where the, the battery is quite easily outlasting the, the life of the vehicle as well. Um, you know, if, if you're doing 3,000, if, if a battery has 3,000 cycle life, for example, um, 
that's that's you know that's 10 years of doing 300 cycles a day well that's quite a lot of use <laughs> and so you know at a, at a very rough example and so um actually the battery isn't isn't a major concern um anymore it has been in the past but i think we're seeing less and less concerns about that and you can see tesla's on the road now with hundreds of thousands of kilometers on them hundreds of thousands of miles on them um you know the, these things are all possible um you know the the technology is still a little bit in its infancy but i think overall um we're seeing that the reliability and the need for maintenance is much much reduced compared to internal combustion engines and, and okay. as a result more reliable as well Interesting. Okay. And then I was going to say the, the other thing is when it comes to um, fast charging, so I know you talked about the 800 volt systems, um, yeah. not only in terms of battery um, life, but does that have an impact on the overall vehicle itself if you're regularly fast charging? It does. And so if, every time you do a fast charge, particularly if the battery's hot. So for example, if you've been driving down the motorway and you've got your battery up to, a, to an operating temperature, um, and then you stop and you charge quickly and you probably put more heat into it and then you want to go off again on the motorway. That, that's probably about as, you know, in, every, in everyday driving scenarios, that's about as hard as you can, you can push a battery. Um, and so you will see increased degradation because of that. Um, but, but again, I think we're seeing that those are, those are the extreme cases when those things happen, happen a lot. Um, 90% of people won't, won't be pushing it, even if you charge your car occasionally with a fast charge. Um, you're not going to see any noticeable degradation. Um, if you, mo most, most industry sort of an analysis expects most people to be charging at home or, or near to their home if they can't charge at home. And so that, that fast charging will be, will be required and we will get the time down, but it won't be, you know, it's not going to be used all the time by everybody. Um, and so we won't see a huge amount of degradation and it, it won't be a large problem. Um, you know, no different to if you have a, if you buy a car today and you do lots of miles, you expect to see the value of that car go down when you get up to 100,000 miles, for example. And we'll see the same with, with electric vehicles, of course. And so, yes, there is a bit of a problem with degradation, but it's, it's not something that, that's going to be an issue for 99.9% for .9 of people. And, and I think it's worth also saying that the battery technology itself is helping. So, you know, how you... How you, how you develop the materials within the cell, um, how thick you make the foils and the loading of the active material on the cell is, is all an optimization between how, how much energy density you want in there and how, how much power you want to be able to take out or put into the battery and how much heat you want to generate. Um, and it's this heat, of course, that, that creates the, uh, the degradation. Um, and again, we're, we're learning more and more and getting this optimization closer and closer to, to its most optimum point. And so I think these issues are largely falling away, to be honest. Interesting. Nice. Well, thanks. Thanks for the detailed information there. Um, a, another question I have, and I think this is, I think I know the answer to it because you guys are based in Woking um, and kind of McLaren's uh, pedigree. But um, some people would say that a lot of the technologies that we're having in EVs are being imported from outside of the UK. It's not a political question, by the way. It's just, just generally in terms of where the technology is being developed. Um, and so you've got the likes of Tesla. So that'll be like the US. And then, of course, they've got their Gigafactory coming up in Berlin and then you've got one in China and then you've then got the likes of Kia, Hyundai which are obviously pioneering it over there. How do you feel how do you feel about that when, when if someone tells you that specifically as someone who's based in Woking in, in the UK? Yeah so I think I, th I think that we're, we're at a really interesting point for the automotive industry. We know this shift to electrification is going to happen. You know it's going to if it's not government mandated the OEMs are going to have done it by that point anyway. I think I saw um, recently that Lotus have just announced that all of their cars will be EV in the future. And so many other people have, have, have done the same thing. So we know there's going to be a lot of, we know EV is the future. Um, and so now is the time for the UK to be really investing in that. And, and to some extent, the UK government is doing a great job in doing that. So we've got investment going in for Gigafactory in the UK um, with British Vault. Um, and, and the UK government has been really good in supporting these initiatives. Um, we also have a project within McLaren um, supported by the Advanced Propulsion Centre, which is a, a part of the UK government, um, that is looking at the supply chain for the electronic components. Again, I talked about silicon carbide and how that's kind of the next technology behind batteries. Batteries is kind of the, the low-hanging fruit. It's the, the biggest, most obvious thing you want to... Um, uh, you want to address um, in, in the vehicle, in the technology. Um, but the, the electronics behind it is probably the next thing. Um, and so we've got a project where we're, we're building an entire UK-based supply chain for silicon carbide, 
power electronics because we see that as a key technology that's going to help the differentiation. When, when we talk about a third wave of electrification, it's going to be an absolutely key technology that almost all, something like 70 to 90% of vehicles by 2030 will be based on. Um, so that's a collaborative project with, uh, I think, 12 other partners. Um, and, and yeah, we, it's a really exciting time and it's it's good to see that in the in the Brexit negotiations, for example, whatever your uh, view is on Brexit, um, there's the um, country of origin um, laws that have come in there that say electric vehicles have to have batteries or cells manufactured in the UK. Um, but it would be good to get more components of the cars manufactured in the UK because we, we've got a great manufacturing base here. We've got a great technology base and an innovation culture that a lot of other countries don't have. Now that perfectly leads me on to ASIN, which you're a chairman of. So can, can you tell us a little bit more about ASIN as, as to what it stands for and, and what, what you do? Yeah, so ASIN is the Automotive Electronics Systems Innovation Network, um, which is a long way of saying it's an industry body that looks after the automotive electronics industry. Um, so we have members ranging from OEMs to electronic suppliers, component suppliers, uh, and it's really all about um, advancing um, their interests in, in the automotive electronics industry. Um, so that can range from working with government um, to make sure that these, these technologies are, are made aware of and that governments are putting the right focus on making sure these industries get recognised. Um, to bring in together the big players in the industry as well as the small players, of course, that's also important to make sure that the challenges, challenges are being addressed. So we look at things like electrification. We have an electrification work group, but we also look at connected and connected um, technology for vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and also cybersecurity. So really looking at all of the, all of the future challenges for the automotive electronics industry. So yeah, thank you so much um, for explaining that. It's actually quite interesting to see what will happen in the industry, specifically as, as someone who's recently reviewed the Tesla Model 3 when it comes to automation. It's quite, it, it, it's fascinating to see the technology there and how it can be integrated and potentially further improved with you know, infrastructure and in terms of like the roads uh, network. So um, Stephen, look, thank you so much for your time. Um, really appreciate it and all your detailed answers as well. Uh, really good to know. And um, yeah, just, Look forward to seeing more of your technologies applied, literally, in, in more consumer and, of course, most vehicles. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Chris.